Well, Charles, it's another lovely Sunday as spring closes in. <laughs> exactly. Good to see you, it's, as always. It's good to be back here, and I, we had a little hiatus on the Sunday with Charles. Yes, and it was partially to do with Easter, partially to do with our good friend Robin Gritz being in Washington, D.C., and partially to do with the uh, temporary disarray being caused by the malicious interference of hackers. Don't like the sound of that. No, and you know, they get very upset when I call them hackers, but you know what hackers do, right, Charles? Could they hack? Well, they hack, <laughs> yes, but the very nature of hacking is they search for weaknesses within systems. We've heard of exploits. Hackers are all about finding the weakness. So if you've got a brick house and I'm knocking on the bricks and that's too difficult to get through and I'm knocking on the garage and that's too difficult to get through and I knock on the window and it breaks, I go in that hole. So whether it's a physical attack on a hardware system or a software attack or an exploit of the mechanisms through which YouTube allows people to submit complaints about videos, hmm. the individuals who are striking these things are hacking. Hmm. And we've heard, of course, from our good friend Quinn Michaels, when you can't hack the system, you hack the user. Mm -hmm. And when you can't hack the hardware of the system, perhaps you could create a huge array of fake accounts or real accounts with fake names or multiple accounts per person or accounts that are driven by artificial intelligence or assisted by some sort of software application that allows one person to control hundreds or maybe thousands of these accounts, perhaps some sort of database that mm -hmm. manages an array of YouTube accounts and allows you to submit complaints about a certain user or a certain video, whether those complaints are valid or not. You know, Charles, when people steal our live stream, your intellectual property, my intellectual property, material you work very hard to put together, they steal it and they put it out on their hoax channel. They think that's okay. They think that's their freedom of speech as an anonymous hoax channel, not even representing who they are, not even making any valid criticism or commentary on what you and I say. Certainly someone could replay a portion of Sunday with Charles and make some additional commentary sure. or criticize what we say or make fun of what we say or augment what we say. That could be useful, but just stealing it and repurposing it, particularly on a monetized platform, is a no-no. Yeah, it doesn't seem right. I mean, I think that obviously Google and YouTube are gigantic corporations and clearly there are a large number of videos out there and they can't get everything right. But it does seem from what you're reporting and your, your experience, our experience, it does seem as if, you know, when people make more than just defamatory, uh, you know, dangerous accusations. Yes. And you complain about them to YouTube and they leave them up there and you go and you complain about it to the police and nothing happens and you complain about the FBI and maybe something well, will happen. Well, that's just started the FBI complaint. Right. I'm still hopeful that the New York FBI will be helpful and right. they called back so quickly. We have had multiple people tell us that that is a strong indication that we may have hit on something of interest to the FBI. Right. So, you know, it's just, I think, time to get this going in a, in a, in a better direction. There should be one set of standards, in my mind, for people who, who, who lodge a complaint form, identify themselves, and they say, I'm, I'm lodging this complaint for these reasons. Then, you know, Google comes to you or somebody at YouTube comes to you and says, this complaint has been filed. You know, we don't know who this person is. Do you have a reaction? As you guys try to resolve it, you know, as yeah. opposed to letting, you know, creating this opportunity where anybody behind some fake name can lodge a spurious complaint. Right. That doesn't seem to be fair or right at all. And in fact, thinking about it, you know, I realize that Google has first mover advantage with YouTube, uh, but there will come a moment in time where people will look at this and say, you know, if this is the way they're going to behave. 
on the heels of the way in which Facebook is behaving so arrogantly and now maybe Twitter so Could arrogantly. Could be a backlash. A, a backlash against them and an opportunity for new formats because as the technology, the cost of producing um, these videos drops, which it will continue to drop, and as the cost of storing everything that YouTube has to store you know, is, is going to be high for them, it creates an opportunity for a new entrant. Um, yeah. Well, and Mike Adams, the health ranger, is doing that, and we wish him the best of luck. We're going to participate in that video network, Real.Video, once that comes online. But of course, YouTube is still the largest repository of video content on the internet, and these nefarious, cowardly, anonymous individuals have had an impact. They, they did their strike right at a moment where Crowdsource the Truth was really gaining momentum in the days after I revealed American intelligence media to be essentially a fraud spreading false information and Douglas Gabriel to be maliciously spreading false information about Crowdsource the Truth and about me. We shot up from about 51 or 52,000 to about 57,000 and uh, we've even had individuals who have said you know, they've represented uh, Steemit, which is a blockchain-driven cryptocurrency-backed social media network. One of the blockchain witnesses for Steemit actually called in and specifically said he didn't like the idea of 50,000 subscribers hearing negative information about Steemit. Now, he didn't offer countermanding information that indicated that anything that I had said was wrong. He just said he didn't like the negative information getting out. So I don't think that means that that person took a strike at the channel, but certainly indicates that there were people who didn't like the message that we were putting out. And then rather than putting out something that says we're wrong, they just make up false stuff and strike the channel. So I want to talk about this so that people who are seeing Sunday with Charles on the original Crowdsource The Truth YouTube channel, which they will later today, even though we've been banned from live streaming and from uploading new videos. Uh, they'll see this later today, and I want them to know that they can, uh, they can subscribe to the new Crowdsource The Truth YouTube channel, which of course is conveniently named simply Crowdsource The Truth 2. How did you come up with that name? And, you know, it was a really... Uh, <laughs> Arduous process. We went through uh, many iterations and, do, do, do you and arrived thought, at two. You, th you thought about using the French "do" yeah. "do" or the well, or the, you know, the idea was if people can't see new videos and they start searching for crowdsource the truth, or when people steal our intellectual property and our content and put it up, uh, I I try to you know leave the crowdsource the truth logo on there. So at least we're getting the benefit of advertising when these malicious individuals steal the content. And, um, you know, that was the idea. We're just trying to put out facts, right. evidence, information that's available from uh, mostly public sources, IRS, uh, various charity monitoring websites, the charities themselves, firsthand testimony from witnesses to things, former FBI, former CIA contractors, former law enforcement individuals, witnesses to the Las Vegas shooting, pathologists who have experience, you know, I'm not just making stuff up and spouting it out to people. I do share my opinions from time to time and people are free to dislike those, but you know, we've got a process here and someone's trying to stop us from going through it. So in short, you weren't trained at CNN. Was not trained at CNN. Right. Anderson Cooper has his own way of doing things. Right. We will not be interviewing Stormy Daniels unless you want to go to a strip club in Philly. I think it's outside Pittsburgh. Whatever. And, you know, and, uh, <laughs> Even that, better. No, I don't think so. That's not happening. <laughs> not happening. So I think, you know, once again, this consistent high quality output of the art department deserves a lot of notice. We're not, we don't like to use vulgarity on Crowdsource the Truth 1, 2, or Sunday with Charles, but the inventive minds might take a little bit of time in the comments section to see, you know, what this post office box, how, you know, you could use P and O in a different combination, and then you think about box. And, and we didn't want to use that in the title, but you know, in the comments section, you know, you might want to let them rip. Yeah. The, uh, 
Well, of course, it's a send-up of the famous film The Postman Always Rings Twice, and of course, parody of famous artwork, famous films, that's, that's certainly covered by fair use in copyright law. As a matter of fact, it's given special consideration, but I don't think we can use parody to falsely accuse someone of a crime they have not committed or we have no evidence of. Of course, we are uh, presenting copious evidence of crime on the regular and we would welcome the, the Clintons to openly challenge you or I, Bill or Hillary could call in, they could oh, sure. email <laughs> truth, the crowdsource the truth. I'm NYC Jason on Skype. Bill or Hillary could call us and debate us. They could even come right here to the apartment, sit down, we could debate with them. I don't think that will happen. I don't think that will. You could offer Bill, he's a, a vegan, I think, give him some kombucha. Yeah. Maybe you like that. <laughs> I don't know, Hillary, we don't, we, I don't think we'd have enough wine in the apartment here. Maybe we could kill two birds with one stone and we could interview both Bill and Stormy Daniels at the strip club in uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh. He might be there. Yeah, he'd, he'd probably be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably already there. Probably already there. But Charles, as usual, you've created a wonderful presentation for us today. Thank you. Lots of material to get to. Well, let's just take a second on this first page before we even get into the, um, into the uh, uh, disclaimer. Um, I have, and I'm sure we all have, had experience getting post office boxes. For a while, I had a property out in the country, and I didn't want to have my mail you know, half a mile away from the house on the road, uh, so I, I, I organized a post office box, but it was just for personal use. And so there it's kind of straightforward stuff. If you, you know, if you have a family, members of the family can send mail to that post office box, it's no biggie. But there's a big difference when you set up a corporation. Oh yeah? Uh, because uh, corporations, they can start out small and end up now the Clinton Foundation at one point had like 1,200, 2,000 people. You start sending mail to a corporate post office box. Yeah. There's special restrictions and we're gonna take people through that, that apply. Like and why? It, yeah, I'm curious to hear that because, you know, Steam It seems to have a post office box and that's about it. Well, you have to, first of all, it, there are overarching rules for the post office. So the post office, uh, postal fraud became a, a, a thing, a crime, in 1872, hmm. well before there was an IRS, hmm. right? well before there were issues of charity fraud, stuff like that. So post office fraud has been a big issue and there is something called the postal police. So. Yeah. When you go in and you say, you know, you want to set something up as a company using a post office box, uh, you've got to present evidence to the post office that you are a company, that you are mm. who you say you are. And more than that, you've got to, the modern rules are that you, if you have a post office box, you have to update your application. You have to renew it constantly. So if things change, you've got to tell the post office about those changes. And if, you, you know, more or fewer employees are, are allowed to use, you've got to give the names. And there's a, a, really a complex process that the Clinton Foundation, of course, has not followed. Wow. And, it, and we're going to take people through that. So there's yet another uh, weapon in our arsenal here. Mm. We've got the state attorneys general. We're tuning them up state by state, and we're going to put the pressure up on that. We've got the IRS already investigating. We've got multiple FBI offices investigating. We've got multiple foreign governments investigating. Yeah. And it seems only fair that we give the postal police something to do. That's right. And so I hope the postal police, I hope they're just as tough as that you know, fake episode with Seinfeld, yeah. which really was very, very funny when yeah. somebody came after, I think it was, was it Newman, George? Right? Hmm? Oh. oh, Newman was somehow involved. Yeah, Newman knew. was always fighting with, with and yeah, that's uh, Zero Mostel's son, you know. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, Josh Mostel. Uh, I sold Zero Mostel a bike once when I was a kid. Wow. But anyway, back on point here. Um, in that episode, uh, the postal police c come after George and Jerry for a missing library book or missing something. Oh, like Mr. A Bookman, right? Yeah, the library Book <laughs> police. Well, you know, it's interesting, Charles, because the main post office, actually, I think for the whole of the United States, is the main postal branch right there on 8th Avenue and 34th. I don't know about the whole United States. I think it is. It's the main, big, huge one, no? No. no. So they're, they're organized uh, zip code by zip code. Uh -huh. and, and so uh, it, it's very interesting here. There are all sorts of ways that you can cheat with a post office box. You can send, uh, instead of sending you know, 2,000 letters, 
and pay the stamp on each thing. You send a, a package to a post office box. All sorts of ways you can cheat. But we're going to show huh. how the Clinton Foundation was a fraud. This is a Latin phrase, ab initio, from the start. Ooh. We're going to take, we're just going to focus here on 1997, 1998, a little bit on 1999. Uh, and we're going to explain how uh, the, this Clinton Foundation um, has been exploiting lax oversight in various places, in, starting in, in Little Rock in Arkansas. But uh, beyond that, once we take this you know, all the way through, tomorrow I'm going somewhere to review 6,000 pages of evidence that has been assembled on a mm. lot of different states mm -hmm. uh, to discuss it with uh, friends of mine who have been looking at this for months now. Wow. We're just focused, we're not going to go through 6,000 slides today, yeah. just nine. But here what we're talking about, and we want people to start thinking about, is all the different ways that you can commit mail fraud using fake addresses, fake post office boxes, uh, and fake charities. And you know, when you start soliciting, sending out hundreds of thousands of pieces of mail from fake addresses across state lines, potentially to donors who should not be allowed to give, like foreign governments, in this way, you've got some major league problems. And what I, I, we, I bring all this up to focus on 97, 98, 99, because the, the vaunted team of dopey James Comey who's about to make t another 10 million bucks off this stupid book he's writing. Crazy. Which I can't wait to see. Robert Mueller, who I think is, you know, people say white hat, black hat, and I'm- Terrible. Black hat. And Rod Rosenstein, I don't understand how that person, you know, he, he can't say he's stupid when it comes to numbers. He was a summa cum laude graduate from Wharton. That's very tough to do. Yeah. You know, there's numbers people flock to Wharton and to be summa from Wharton and then get into Harvard Law School. He's no dope. He had to have seen this fraud. He had to have seen the problems with the Clinton Foundation way back when, with Whitewater way back when. And for some reason, he and Dopey James Comey and Bob Mueller have let the Clinton skate going way, way, way back. So how are these people, Mr. Trump, you know, how, who let, you know, who encouraged Rosenstein to be the Deputy Attorney General, the most powerful person under Jeff Sessions? Who was the idea who were the people pushing that? Who vetted this man? Who right. let the dogs in, Who Charles? let the dogs in? Who's feeding them? You See, know. what I was getting at is, at very least, that post office is the main postal branch in New York City. Yeah, it is. And I have seen the postal police in there. Sure. I believe that's where their office is, so we could speak to them potentially. But it's interesting how, just as I listen to you speaking about fake addresses, fake post office boxes, Boy, it sure sounds equivalent to some of the fake internet addresses that are being used to attack in the same way. All of these crooks use the same tactics. Well, so here, here's, here's the thing, and this is why it's so dangerous. If you have a charity, like the Clinton Foundation, in quotes, it's not really a charity in my opinion, but if you had a charity that, where, where the trustees were prepared to be crooked and look the other way, where the accounting firm was prepared to be crooked, where the local banks were prepared to be crooked, where people needed tax deductions, where people were very charged up and active politically and it's expensive to fund these political campaigns. When you set something like this up, where you have these slightly confusing addresses, right. slight, they're not exactly the right name, not the right address, and you start going around to little branches, bank branches, and you got a piece of stationery that says, you know, I'm the president of the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation, and I'd like to open a bank account sure, in your sir, branch. Right away. You know, they, 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 oh, yeah, I'm not going to, is Bill Clinton going to come by maybe? And right. Would he sign the application? You know, you get these things opened, not simply in Little Rock, but if you're really crooked, you can then go across state lines to other places like Massachusetts, where we have mm. the name of the bank in mm -hmm. Massachusetts, where they illegally opened up a bank account. We have the details in New York where they illegally opened up a bank account. Hmm. What you do, the trick here is, once you open a bank account for a charity, even if that charity disappears, you keep the bank account open, right? And then more money goes into that bank account. And if the trustees aren't checking and the accounting firm may or may not know about it, you have a way to get dirty money from around the world sent into the United States and nobody will know, right? Because you've got a crooked bank you got a crooked accounting firm, and there are all of these warning signs that are right there, that were there back in, in 2001, starting in February 2001, 
when uh, Mary Jo White, who is a renowned U.S. attorney in the Southern District, and then Dopey James Comey took over late in, in, in 2001, early 2002. Bob Mueller took this thing over. I mean, he was obviously the head of the FBI doing a lot of stuff. He takes over in September of 2001. And in four years, these idiots cannot see what is right there. They didn't need to issue a subpoena or anything. These are public records that we're going through covering the period 97, 98, 99 that should have allowed this massive team that, uh, you know, to look into the records and say, you know what? This ain't no, this ain't no stinking charity, <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so here on the second uh, page is our standard uh, disclaimer. And for the new people, uh, we have a different way of doing things. We don't do things the way the New York Times does, or certainly not the way CNN and MSNBC do. Washington or, you know, Compost. Washington Compost, the fish wrapper, <laughs> the New York Times. We, you know, we actually start and try to find the evidence and we're in the business of sharing our sources with you, the crowd, so you can see how we do this work. And you can, I, I'm just like you, frankly, in the, in the crowd. I started out, you know, first umpty up years of my life through August 2007. I had written a few articles. I did given speeches relating to banking and things like that. But I was not involved in the business of exposing fraud really until August of 2007. I started, I was just interested in, you know, speaking up and trying to change things. You can do the same thing out there. Those of you who are interested in this show, and we're trying to encourage you, we're trying to galvanize a new fighting force to go out there to fight for the truth, find the truth, start with this evidence, think about this evidence. If you see crimes that are not being followed, like this massive, epic Clinton Foundation fraud, which still has not been brought to justice, if you see, you know, this unequal treatment of the law with Corinne Brown over rotting in prisons, uh, who knows where, uh, now for five years. Florida somewhere, right? I don't know if she's in Florida. She might, it's a federal prison somewhere. But anyway, she's 71 year old African American former congresswoman. She's in prison. She gets pro uh, prosecuted. She gets convicted. She's incarcerated. Hillary Clinton, I suppose you could argue it's jail to be hanging around with Bill <laughs> and the diary expert and everybody else. Uh, but but um, I can think of a lot of people who could fill up the federal prisons if uh, things were handled properly. <laughs> That's right. Hopefully so, we'll get there. So here we have um, the standard disclaimer. I encourage people to read it and think about it. Uh, I encourage you to go to my site. There's a lot of information on it. And of course, Jason's uh, various playlists. We've got the one uh, up there. There are, there's quite a lot. I'm actually very proud to be associated with Crowdsource the Truth and with you, Jason. I think Thank you do you, great work, and I, it's an honor to be on your platform with you. Um, I love to see uh, people share these various videos. We're going to do go through an effort. We've had several people say, you know, you've got so much here. Could you give us a way to organize it now? Can we go back over? And I'll do that. We'll, we'll uh, do one or more stories in, the, in various print platforms about it and we'll have something up there. We might even think about going back over all these videos and maybe doing short intros, reintros to each of them. Uh, we might think about putting uh, the slides in one central place, uh, maybe on my site or somewhere else. But there's a lot of good work here. And um, to understand, to see the longstanding pattern and practice of epic fraud, conspiracy, racketeering, corrupt practices, I mean, this is not traffic ticket stuff. I mean, this is, this is a long-standing pattern and practice to seek money via legal means to spend it on, without paying taxes or without paying your fair share of taxes. Um, it is the use, it is Robin Hood in reverse. It is stealing from the poor to live a fancy champagne and caviar platinum lifestyle. And, you know, shame on the American public and shame on the regulators for letting this go on for so long. May I bring something to your attention and get your input on it, Charles? Sure. So this is a video called The Pinko Panthers that we did with Fabian Chalandon just a few weeks ago. And you and Fabian did amazing work revealing the ties to Unitaid and uh, some of the financial crimes that are now being pursued in France. And of course, since the release of this video, Mr. Sarkozy has been arrested, correct? Yeah, I think so, or as we like to speak to Pipi Le Pew. I wonder if this video had anything to do with it, but you noticed this before I did, Charles, the 1.1 thousand thumbs down. 
Yeah. And of course, this video has only 14,000 views. Now, I bring this up because as you look at the uh, playlist here for Sunday with Charles, which of course is on the original Crowdsource The Truth channel, these videos are quite popular. They are regularly getting, you know, well over 10,000 views, going to 20, 30,000 pretty regularly. And generally speaking, it's a very high percentage of likes. In fact, it doesn't even make logical sense that one in 14 people like, uh, watching something would dislike it because when you start dealing with a, uh, a sample of that many thousands, it just seems like people would leave if they didn't like right. it, not stick around and give it a thumbs down. And I bring this up not because I am uh, fascinated with being liked or disliked, but because these things affect the algorithms within YouTube that determine who else can search for and find the videos, and they can have an impact on the number of people that ultimately see it. So I feel very strongly that that overwhelming thumbs down rating, which as we can see, really greatly exceeds the standard uh, performance. You know, here's another 23,000 view video that we did about Alibaba, and that was only two weeks ago. So there's really not that much substantial difference in terms of the content or the audience. You and I aren't covering vastly different topics each week. It's always the financial crimes of the Clintons, but I feel like it's possible that something in this video with Fabian may have set someone off to the point that they hacked the system. They used some mechanism to get 1.1 thousand thumbs down on there, and I do believe you'd need 1.1 thousand unique accounts to do that. So just an interesting thing to take note of when people are having their opinion swayed by something they see on the internet. This could be that, I mean, this goes to the heart of India, India Inc., and there are a lot of people in India, and a lot of them are, are computer adept, so it could be that, you know, the Indian government said, you know, we, we, this, these people are getting pretty close here, and uh, this won't be so good for us. But I do take your point. It's one of the things I want to do in the, in the memo, you know, in the various print pieces, is go through all this and, and see, you know, overall how many views do we have, what are the typical relationships, and metrics that are important. Mm -hmm. But it's quite a body of work. I, I, I didn't realize we had now 60 plus. Um, you know, that's going to end up being quite a lot of views, quite a lot of minutes. Right. And I would also say that the overall attack on Crowdsource the Truth was done at a very strategic moment. We had rapidly passed 50,000 regular subscribers. The message that was going out whether it be your research about the Clinton Foundation and their associates and the international money laundering and the vast financial and other crimes that, they, that this, in, this uh, evidence would indicate that they have done, that's just part of it. People were, by shutting down Crowdsource the Truth, they were suppressing the story coming out from Harmon Wilfred, America's first refugee, who will be with us, of course, tomorrow at 7 o'clock. They were suppressing the message from Robin Gritz, from uh, all the other people that we have on this channel, Kevin Ship, all the, all the wonderful people that are bringing information forward about Vegas, et cetera. But I'm yapping too much, Charles. Let's get to yeah, let's go your back information into the slides. today. You're not yapping too much, but let's go to the slides here. Um, if we go to the next page. Yes. Uh, and really, you know, I think there was some breaking news that maybe we should cover right, right away. Um, well, probably the most important and serious matter is these latest accusations of a chemical gas attack in Syria. And I admittedly haven't had very much of an opportunity to look at a lot of the reporting or the evidence, but whenever we hear about this and then we see videos of people with no uh, chemical protection tending to the wounded, or even, you know, short of that, we, uh, you know, it's, they're blaming Assad. Well, why would he use chemical gas if he knows that that would invoke the wrath of the United States, the United Nations, and spell almost certain death and definite war in his country? Why would he do that? Even if he is crazy, 
he obviously doesn't want to be killed. If he's a megalomaniac, he wants to control Syria and remain in power. Doing something that would mean certain destruction doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, I was watching the reports through the morning, early afternoon here in New York on television, and you know what, what struck me is, first of all, the, the territory where this attack uh, allegedly happened is controlled by uh, radical forces fighting against Assad. Of course. Who have their own axe to grind, of course, uh, and they'd love to see Assad re removed. Right. Uh, I am certainly not a medical expert, but this happened last year, and I spoke up on multiple platforms. If there was, if truly chemical weapons were used, then you would think that the people who are going to go in and try to wash this stuff off or get this stuff off the victims would not be exposed with no protective covering, which is what I, what I saw. I mean, I saw, you know, little kids being brought up to hoses and people with no even gloves on, you know, just trying to get the stuff off. And that to me, uh, you know, just looks very, very suspicious. And I always ask myself when thinking about this kind of stuff, who benefits, as you rightly say. And, um, you know, last year when this happened, uh, I, I think the Chinese leader was meeting with Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago and, right. and uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, there was a big response. And of course, um, the predictable people who, who like to see, uh, for, I don't want to say they like to see it, but they're, they're quick to pull the trigger, let's right. just say. We're very happy to pull the trigger and applauded the uh, missile strikes and retaliation and all that. But I think, you know, we've been at this now in the Middle East for a long time. Uh, I heard General Jack Keane, a person I, whose advice I respect, but his full-time job is, you know, teaching or working at the Institute for War. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's, you know, let's keep that, this baby going here, yeah. you know, right? Here's a chance. And he was making these eloquent arguments about how Russia now wants to extend their influence in the Middle East and they're going to do a base in, in, uh, in Syria. I'm not belittling that. But when I, when I think through, I, I say, on the one hand, we have the United States spending $800 billion per year that we know about on military. We have how many bases around the world? Hundreds. Yeah, and we have troops everywhere. We're all over the Middle East. We're all over everywhere. Hmm. And, you know, Russia is a much smaller economy. Right. We're expanding. We're, you know, increasing our spending. We're now elevated Russia and, and China as, you know, top targets of our military apparatus. And, you know, that might cause Russia and China to be a little bit more nervous, nervous about yeah. dealing with us. And I'm not saying, you know, we necessarily, well, I'm certainly not saying that we, we, we should assume there are no enemies in the United States of America. Of course there are. And I think though it's hurt many of our industries to see China, China's economy suck jobs out of the, out of the heartland in particular and, and suck intellectual property out. And we have a structural trade deficit with China. Mario Cook is saying that there are photos coming out now that already indicate that the chemical attack was another hoax. Really? Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I, I hope we don't immediately jump into putting our fingers on the, uh, you know, pushing the trigger. Uh, and I think we think we, sh we need to think calmly about it. This is a nice segue into the first thing here. When I heard about this uh, Skripal incident in Salisbury, a lovely town, by the way, in England, I've never been. Uh, uh, I, you know, I right away, I think you and I instantly talk, we, of course we talk constantly, uh, but um, I just, I, it didn't ring true to me. First, the whole way in which, the basis upon which this Skripal guy was exchanged. Right. You know, and how he ended up back, as a result of rounding up spies in the United States, we did a trade wherein a spy held by Russia was released to the UK. I mean, that, I, I still don't understand that. I still have problems uh, thinking through and understanding the degree to which the US, UK, sec uh, national security, MI6, NSA, et cetera, all those bilateral GCHQ. Yeah, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the way that seems to be handled. I mean, I, 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 I question in general, given what's happened with the advances in technology, how anybody can stand over, over top these security agencies and truly bring them to heel. When I start hearing about, you know, people flying to the UK and or coming from the UK here and meeting with private contractors and, you know, creating steel dossiers and doing stuff like that and abuses of the FISA court and maybe abuses. When I, when I understand that UK law is very different 
than, than U.S. law. It doesn't offer its citizens the same degree of protection. Right. And when I hear all that, um, I'm, I'm most uncomfortable, you know, leaping into, you know, to a verdict the way Donald Trump did, kicking all these Russians out. And yeah, the why is he doing that? I don't understand it. I, don't, I mean, I, I think that his, I'm just guessing that the, he has, you know, people are saying you got to be tough. You, you got Mueller over here alleging you colluded. You know, if you give in too easily, they'll say you're a softy. You see, you oh, are colluding. See, that's it. They, they love to have these scenarios where whatever you do, you're screwed. Right. Do nothing, you're soft. Kick them out, now we're at war with Russia. Right, right. <laughs> or a war of words, at least. And, and again, if, it'd be one thing if we had a, you know, a, a team that had worked together since September 11th, 2001. I, we could go to further. To cover the facts of the incident? Well, no, no, well, no, a team that had actually done a good job and oh. not kept America at war for 17 years and not caused tens of thousands of people to lose their lives, Americans and many more to be wounded, and right. people around the world. It'd be one thing if we had a team that, you know, everything actually worked and we should say, you know, what do you think, guys and ladies? I mean, you get everything right. wrong, actually. Yeah. You get everything <laughs> wrong. That's why we're not listening to you. I mean... <laughs> So um, I, I, think, uh, I, I think the whole way in which the May government uh, has been behaving, uh, in particular with the Skripal thing, is, uh, is not going to sit well with the electorate in the UK, which is the electorate sh that should matter. I put this link to the, uh, the mirror story up there just for a laugh. That's the next one. <laughs> That is a good one, actually. Yeah, I don't know if this is fake news or not, but uh, I, I guess it's one of the Russian senators saying the Queen's just a lush, and <laughs> Theresa May has a brandy habit. cocktails all day. And I would, I would remind people that in Russia, people do drink a fair bit of vodka yeah. with regularity, but uh, it's not the best picture of the Queen. I mean, the Queen is like 90-something, so whatever she's doing is working, apparently. Yeah, I remember years back, I think, they used to send, from the tabloids, they'd send uh, reporters to go to the Queen Mother's palace and you know, go through her garbage every But is that the Queen or the Queen's mother? I, I, I know, there's a, neither. I think, oh, was it the Queen's mother or not? I forget what it was, but it was a generation older than the present Queen. Huh. And the volume of alcohol that would come out was just mind-numbing. Red wine, <laughs> white wine, cognac, whiskey, vodka, gin. Blah, blah. It was wow. just tremendous amounts of, but maybe they had big parties. Yeah, or something. So then this Zero Hedge story, the third one, uh, I really don't like to see this story at all. Uh, that the Department of Homeland Security, if this is true, is now, has a new database to track you, to track wow. me. I believe media it. Media info, well I just, you know, I, that's not right. That's no. really not right. I mean. I think in the olden days, you know, let's Whoop. say pre the internet, uh, the, in 1994, um, journalists had tremendous power. Hmm. Uh, they basically decided, ed editors at the newspapers decided what stories got played in which newspapers, and that's changed a lot. I think for the better, the traditional lamestream, I would argue now, corporate media is on its heels and alternative media is on the rise, and people can think for themselves. We don't really need the assistance of Big Brother to say, you know, with our taxpayer dollar, dollars, let's keep track of all these people. We saw the abuses that occurred under Barack Obama's presidency. Presidents, you know, they, they, and politicians, they get criticized all the time. One of the things I may do in, in future is to start collecting, again, political cartoons ones about Abraham Lincoln were vicious. You can get copies of them, They're really ad hominem, gross arguments. There's a long history in this country and in England and many countries of tough, tough, withering criticism against mem members of the public, and in particular against the leaders. To turn around and say now, what we're gonna do is use our money, taxpayer money, to track down critics of the government in supposedly a country like America that's free, has freedom of the press, I don't buy that at all. I don't see this as a valid use of government money at all. You know, Charles, something that occurs to me, one of the most persistent and belligerent antagonists that I've had for the past nine months is actually a guy named David Swigert. Are you familiar with him? 
You've told me about him, yeah. George's brother, and by his own admission, he has been a Department of Homeland Security contractor, and he has been pivotal in pushing the false notion that at some point I called in a bomb threat. And he's called me a conspiracy theorist, and he's even created what he represents as some sort of official government report to back up his false claims. So you really start to see the danger of an insidious program like this where a complete liar and possibly mentally disturbed individual like David Swigert can generate all this false information and submit it as a report, back it up with ginned up uh, civil lawsuits and, and make people think that there's something happening when there actually isn't. This is actually uh, very interesting that this uh, that this Tyler Durden article should come out on April 7th of all days. And this article seems almost to be written about exactly what's happening to me. Interesting. Yeah. Well, he does, I, I, I forget his name, but I, I know his name. And uh, he does great work, actually. Zero, I know Obama used to say, President Obama used to say it all the time, but in my case, it's true. It's the first thing I check in the morning, and sadly, it's the last thing I check before I go to sleep. Hmm. But uh, because there's so much good information, and again, they follow a very similar format to ours in that when they have a story like this, typically they have a link, multiple links to their sources, so you can check it out. And I love stories like this. Not not every one of them is, you know, obviously 100% perfect, but I, I always learn something. Uh, checking Zero Hedge, and I would encourage members of the crowdsourced truth community to do the same thing. Hmm. It's so, an interesting story for sure. So if we go back, yeah. Um, so this, without before clicking on the Facebook story, um, when we think about what's been going on, let's say from 2000, 1995 forward, where with the advent of Craigslist, uh, basically free personal ads. Uh, classified ads used to, to uh, provide a lot of revenue to local newspapers. So first Craigslist decimated the local newspapers. And then, as I, I remember long ago, the sh I, I recommended that for established brands, there's no real point in spending the amount of money that Coke or Pepsi spends on advertising, in my opinion, because you're not going to change my opinion. I love Coca-Cola. I'm never going to drink Pepsi. I don't care how much money you spend. I don't care what the slogan is. I don't care what movie starlet is out there. I don't that care what's terrible for you, Charles. I know. I, I, I learned that actually when I was playing a <laughs> tennis tournament. I wanted a co. I was in, a, in Bermuda as, as a 17-year-old playing a top national uh, guy who was a very good player, and I wasn't up to his caliber. And we were we broke, and he, and I said, I gotta have something to drink. What do you want? So I'll, I'll have a Coke. And he said, All right, but I'm gonna show you why you don't want to drink Coke. And so he pours it out, and I'm ready. I'm like, oh, I want it. And he says, give me the dirtiest coin that you have. Oh, yeah. And he stripped the... <laughs> just like in 10 seconds. I drank the Coke anyway, because wow. I was thirsty. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I drink Coke sparingly. But I'm just the point being that you're not going to change right. on certain things, preferences Stabbing after brand. a certain age, so why spend the money? So you think about that, and then you think about the degree to which, it could be fake news, but the degree to which advertisers are allocating more and more of the percentage spend per year to Google, uh, sorry, to Twitter, to Google, to Facebook. Um, then you think about the power that those entities now have to, to basically decide if Zuckerberg happens to be a far left lunatic, you know, he can, he can then crush anybody who might want to use his platform. Yeah. And uh, these companies are now phenomenally powerful. Yep. They, they have huge market shares. They have, you know, they may or may not survive intact, given the arrogant statements that, in particular, that Sheryl Sandberg said with her oh, interview yeah. with Dana Perina, Perino of Fox. She said something like, she was asked, um, you know, what if I want to totally get off of Facebook, you know, after having used it for a while? Sandberg said, said well, that would be a paid product. You have to pay to, you know, stop having your own information used by Facebook to mine it for advertising revenue. I think that could well change. It should change. Um, it's this like is New Jersey, they pay, you have to pay to leave. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, these, these, adverti these big companies are basically massive donors to the very regulators who are now going to ask, in theory, tough questions in Congress. We'll see if that really happens.
Mm. I think it's more likely that people will start disengaging from Facebook, even if they have to pay a price, uh, and, and perhaps Twitter and Google, mm. and Yahoo and others. All those. So um, this uh, is a very interesting thing. Uh, if we hit this one here, I, I happen to love Diamond and Silk. I think, I mean, just as comedic and... Yes. But now they've been, Facebook has said that uh, Diamond and Silk are verboten. Really? And I think, you know, that's just wrong. If this is true, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, some of the most... I you, know they were big on YouTube, right? They're big on YouTube and Facebook and everywhere. But the, if we think about, you know, the, the, the hue and cry you know, of all the people in the establishment left, you know, standing up there and defending Katie Griffin and Kathy Griffin, you know, holding the severed head of Donald Trump in parody, that's okay. Mm. But, you know, making fun the way Diamond and Silk do of people of all ethnicity, all genders, all political persuasions, I think Americans and people around the world, we need to remember it's actually funny to laugh at yourself. You make mistakes from time to time. Right. You know, provided it's not vicious, well, you know, or I, I, accusing I people of crimes. Okay, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Accusing people of crimes they didn't commit, that's vicious, right? But yes. I'm, I'm saying, you know, good hearted fun. Right. You know, you want to make fun of my pocket square, you want to make fun of the way I look, whatever. I don't, it doesn't bother me, you know? But, uh, and, and in fact, some of the people who've changed this earth and the planet for the better, Galileo, people who challenged the Orthodox, you know, leaders that r rule the world. Oh, they were ridiculed horribly. Yeah, but the, but the point is, you know, it, you want to encourage these, these challenging thoughts because out of it some good will come. And frankly, right. a lot of what Diamond and Silk have to, had to say has, I think, uh, been, been very thoughtful about the degree to which uh, the Democrat machines in the inner cities have not been helpful to African Americans or minorities at all, mm. you know, and yet, it, it, uh, for, for decades, mm -hmm. African-American voters would come out to vote for people like Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Dick Durbin and people like that who have been atrocious. You know. It's pretty sinister as well, Charles, when powerful voices in minority communities like this are suppressed because Diamond and Silk have the ability to speak to an audience on a level that other personalities might not. So. Uh, when Facebook or anyone tries to suppress them, it's sort of doubly bad than right. you or I. Right. Being so, white men who we're obviously horrible. <laughs> yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, we need to just go directly into the Hudson River and right. swim home right. wherever we came from. But uh, to Diamond and Silk, you're probably way too busy to want to come on our show. You have an open invitation anytime. Love to talk to you. That would really be admire great. your work. Yeah. And sorry to see Facebook do, to, do this to you. We're going to stand up for you. Yeah, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. So if we go back in, now, yeah, this is, uh, uh, you're going to rarely see this is, a, you know, Hell's Frozen Over edition of Sunday with Charles. It's quite rare oh. for you to see me agreeing with Bill Maher. Um, sorry, I accidentally, okay. sometimes that happens. It's okay. There so, he makes a very good point. Now, Laura Ingram, I, I am not paid by LifeSet, though I write a lot of stuff now for them, and Laura Ingram has some sort of business relationship with LifeSet. I like her work. Um, I did not like to see what happened uh, with this guy, David Hogg. Suddenly, you take a 17-year-old kid. He can, he can say whatever he wants, as viciously as he, as he wants to say it. You can't criticize him. If you criticize him, you lose your advertisers. There's or something, your YouTube channel. Or your YouTube channel, or both. And that, that's just not right. And I want to apologize to Mike Lindell for last week, what I said about him. I noticed, um, actually, Mike, thank you for following me on Twitter. I noticed that, and I noticed, and I followed you back. And Jason, you were the one who brought to my attention, here's Mike. Um, and I, you know, it's testament to the degree to which your channel has grown, Jason. I mean, you have about the same, more or less, followers as this guy who's on television nonstop, radio, television, constantly. Yeah. Um, but uh, Mike, thank thank you for standing up and staying. Oh, he follows me as well. There you go. I'll give him a follow. Perhaps we'll order a pillow. <laughs> what two. is the story? Well, we'll talk about that offline. Yeah. But, but I'm it, not but that if you, familiar with my pillow. Well, this is a guy who was in deep distress at one point. He was, he was a, a crack addict or something like that. Ooh. 
he had started a business, got hooked on crack, and he, he's found his way back. And mm. he's, he's you know, clean and sober now. Uh, he, has, he is a relentless advertiser and claims to invented, have invented a pillow that's better than the standard pillow. Hmm. Um, but Mike, thanks for standing up for Laura, who's a good person. I hope her show on Monday will get a lot of attention. I've tried to do my part uh, in a piece that I hope will come out any minute in American Thinker, uh, putting the crosshairs literally on uh, David Brock and his illegally organized Media Matters for America mm. supposed charity, which is really a fake charity, coordinating with something that doesn't really exist lawfully, the Media Mac Matters Action Network. Some mm. details on that coming out in American Thinker. But I think you have another piece on Laura Ingram that we might want to show. I didn't realize that. There you go. I didn't realize that um, Media Matters was a charity. I thought it was some sort of political action group. They're always, you know, uh, Cheryl Atkinson's book was pretty much all about them taking action and destroying people's reputation in the way that many people are trying to do to me. Yeah, so the way this works, it, you can, of course, do that as an individual if you want to get together and, you know, run Be the risk jerk. of being sued or whatever, you can, you can do that. Where it gets very dicey, and this is what my piece in American Thinker is about, when, when, when you want to be an, uh, a charity, the first thing you have to be is an actual straight up organization, which means if you want to be a corporation, you've got a non-for-profit corporation, you have to have articles of incorporation and bylaws and directors and minutes and process and, and you know, if you register in various places, you want to use a fundraiser, you've got a uh, before you solicit in many states, you've got to fill out all the paperwork. You can't use an unregistered solicitor, a solicitation agent. And you, if you want to engage in action, you know, yeah. taking people down the way Brock regularly delights in doing, right. you've got to do that through another organization, which is called a 501c4. And of course, they didn't register that in New York or anywhere else because that's the Clinton way, man. That's a pretty regular practice. Robert David Steele also doesn't register his charities and then goes and solicits a quarter of a million dollars in the state of New York. A felony. Yeah, not just a felony, probably many felonies. Ooh, many felonies, Robert David Steele. Yeah, and so, so anyway, uh, props to you, uh, Mr. Lindell, and I'm sorry I took uh, a shot at you last week, and thanks for standing by, Laura Ingram. Uh, Perhaps it? Mike would like to uh, email truth at crowdsourcethetruth.org, and we could arrange a, a Skype call in on a future uh, sure, Sunday please do with that, Charles Mike. show and talk about his story. That would be very interesting, actually. So yeah. please do that. So if we go back into the slides, yes. uh, that's uh, not it. There we go. Okay. We're all all right. Um, this one here, you know, there, there was a deadline, several deadlines that have passed here, and I have a very hard time uh, with the Justice Department. You know, if the Justice Department issued a subpoena to Charles Ortel or Jason Goodman or Crowdsource the Truth or whatever. You'd be there and, the next day. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we just said, you know what, that deadline, eh, it's the Department of Justice. <laughs> yeah. But now here Congress, a co-equal branch of government, says, uh, you know, here's the subpoena, we want this, we want that, and just, justice under Sessions, under somebody appointed, you know, selected by Donald Trump, vetted by his people, is saying, yeah, no. We're not going to do that. And it's, crazy. it's just, we look, we look foolish yeah. as a country. It's just foolishness. And, you know, what is really going on? I think what's going on is that for decades now, uh, there's been a uniparty. There have been people on the establishment right, Republican, establishment left, Democrat, who have been inserting their operatives into career positions at the IRS, justice, elsewhere, state government, so that the elections, they basically don't matter. Right. You know, you, you get a different person in there, but the career people are stuck in. They've got all these excuses about why they're not going to get anything done. There are all, many of them are unionized, and you can't fire them that easily. Hmm. And so uh, this, though, is a case where there have been, you know, I, when I saw this in the very beginning, way back when, I said this is way worse than Watergate, just mm -hmm. my instincts. You're hearing that regularly. It's way worse than, than Watergate. This is about uh, a president and his team of advisors and his team of patrons um, perhaps rigging the 2012 election, hmm. which is something people are not yet talking enough about. Right. You know, dampening the inquiry into the Fast and Furious and the various scandals, 
uh, uh, who knows how the voting actually happened in 2012. There were substantial rumors about voting inconsistencies, irregularities, how much meddling happened in that cycle. And for certain, in the 2015-16 cycle, you know, it made no sense to let Hillary Clinton be encouraged to rig the primaries the way she did with the superdelegates and the, the, the deals we know about so far. It made no sense for that to happen. That did happen. It made no sense for uh, you know, the, the investigation into misuse of classified information by Hillary Clinton to be sidelined the way it was and everything else. And now, you know, it's almost two years of, uh, Trump will finish his, his uh, two years, I guess, a week, I mean, in, in January of next year. So we're not quite a year and a half, year and a half into it at this point. But I mean, come on, it should be possible. There should be a means for Donald Trump to, to, and his people to sit down in the swamp. Well, and to say to the Justice Department, look, you know, if you can't tell me, Donald Trump, you've got to be able to tell somebody why you're going slow here. And, you know, we've got to have Horowitz or somebody, maybe it's this guy out in Utah, get to the bottom, this U.S. attorney, get to the bottom of why the go slow, why the no look, what's going on with the Horowitz memo. Now, maybe there are very good reasons why this is going slow. Maybe there are grand juries or, you know. But didn't we hear for months that it was coming in March and here we are, first week of April is over, next week we're into the second week of April, where is the, what's the, the guy's been working on this forever. I don't know, and, you know maybe, then it'll be, it's like the big, you know, rope-a-dope, let them wait it out, you know, we'll get closer and closer to the election and then it'll Nothing be. Nothing burger. No, no, you know, <laughs> then it'll be, it'll be, well, we can't give it to you now, we're too close to the election. Right. You know, that, that. this has got, come on, this is long enough, it's a long trail of evidence. We need to have this stuff out and good for the president for, for raising the heat. And you know, Charles, along the lines of what we were discussing earlier, when you talk about the 2012 election, et cetera, I remember very clearly when Barack Obama was running in 2008, connecting with a lot of friends from high school and friends from the past on Facebook. Facebook was very new, at least to me, in 2008. I don't think everybody was on there, and certainly YouTube was very new. I don't think we saw the kind of influence from you know, alternative media. Right. I didn't know about Infowars in 2008, and certainly that organization has gained a lot of power and a lot of following. And whatever people think about it, it definitely represents the strongest version of that counterpoint, and certainly was an inspiration to me to do Crowdsource the Truth. So I think we've seen in the years since then, 2016 might have been the year that independent media on the internet reached critical mass. And now we see all this backlash from Department of Homeland Security wanting to call people like me a conspiracy theorist and have lunatics like Dave Swigert write crazy reports that they can submit to whoever and think they're going to do something, but it's really just fiction that he's submitting uh, or his own psychotic fantasies. Great. So if we could just go back to the slides. Um, yes. Uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to say real quickly about the uh, special counsel, you know, friend of this show, who you've been on his radio show once, Larry Clayman, has got this petition on freedomwatchusa.org that people can go and sign. Uh, Larry has been trying to become the second special counsel, and I feel pretty confident that if we had Larry over there draining of the swamp, he's kind of like the roto-rooter of swamp draining, so maybe people might want to consider checking that out. Good. And then this tweet from uh, Donald Trump is pretty amusing. This one here. Always good for a laugh. What do we got there? So the FBI closed the case on Hillary, which was a rigged investigation. They exonerated her even before they ever interviewed her. He should have put interviewed in quotes. And they never even put her under oath. And much more. So true, Jesse. So, yeah, good shout out. I mean, for look Waters at the time world. on that tweet. What is the time? 427. Whoa, when does the guy sleep? I know. I mean, that's, that's impressive. Was he up early or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I would guess. Unless these are time, done in advance and set up. time zone or? No, he's in, Amer he's in Washington, D.C. Hmm. Wow. That's quite a tweet. From POTUS. From POTUS, the man. Uh, so we're over here somewhere. Actually, we're in the slides, I hope. 
Yeah, I'm trying a new method of trying to have those ready. What I really need is another screen so I can have this on one and the slides mm -hmm. on another. But uh, I, yeah, so co Congress as well, this guy Mark Meadows, um, is threatening to impeach Rosenstein if he doesn't produce these documents. And, good. And I, I, yeah, good on you, as they say down in the Bahamas. I thought that was Australia. Maybe, uh, maybe there too. Yeah. So uh, we can go to the next page, actually. Do we don't want to see Judge Janine talk about that? Uh, I've got that at the end. Okay. So um, we've been spending a lot of time. It won't be all that new to many of the crowdsourcers, but uh, we've been spending a lot of time on the degree to which Rosenstein, Comey, and Mueller, in my opinion, and I think Jason's opinion, have dirty hands. And I did this piece, this first piece here, Life Set, uh, Poly Zet or whatever it's called now. Um, yeah, it's the next tab. Yeah. yeah. Now this, if you, if people in the community have the time, this has really gotten a lot of attention already, but I encourage you to circulate this piece around to your friends, follow all of the links. In essence, this is, a, this is very important because th this uh, is an incident that locks into the same time frame as when the Uranium One informant is claiming that money was being funneled, cash money was being funneled illegally into the Clinton Foundation without being declared. Mm. This is evidence that I, I found and others found. It's all linked in here of how it is mathematically impossible for 37.2 million to have gone from the parent Clinton Foundation to the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund during 2010 when you follow the money the way I can follow the money. Hmm. So I have correspondence that, that I share in here um, with the Minnesota uh, authorities where they tell us how much money the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund had raised by May 31st, 2010. Hmm. And we know how much money it had raised through the whole year. And we also know that the Clinton Foundation hadn't sent any money into the only office that existed for the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund, which was in Washington, D.C., because they claim they sent $37.2 million to a post office box for the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund in Maryland, when no su such office was registered, when no such bank, no such, um, it's just impossible to have been done this way. And the reason this is all very interesting and dangerous is $37 million, even for the Clintons, is a lot of money. <laughs> and you know, Corinne Brown, remember, is in prison for five years over eight hundred thousand. Right. This is thirty-seven million. It sure looks to me like it was improperly accounted for at the Clinton Foundation books. It may not actually have gone to Haiti. There are all these kinds of question marks around Haiti, and we're going to break some news here in this broadcast. That another reason why this is very suspicious is that Barack Obama and Michelle Obama gave over two hundred thousand of their one point some odd million. Uh, Nobel Peace Prize, so right. richly earned, uh, dare I say, uh, in April of 2010, they mm. gave that money to the Clinton Bush to the Clinton Foundation to give to the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund. So how did that happen? Well, when you first told me about that, right away it occurred to me that that is a mechanism, or could be a mechanism, of getting Barack Obama involved in the fraud for an amount of money that would implicate him if he failed to protect the fraud. Right. Stinks of that. Right. And, it, it, you know, and it's just classic stuff. Here you have you know, both members, you know, what do they say, uh, brothers from a different mother? Or right. <laughs> but they're now fast friends and doing all kinds of projects around the world. HW did projects with Bill and the tsunami and then he did Katrina with Bill, and then he did something called the Gulf like Coast Recovery. Tsunami of cash. Yeah, exactly. And you know, this is one where uh, Rod Rosenstein was the U.S. attorney in 2010 in Baltimore in 2011, and these tax filings for 2010 were refiled in 2015. So the statute of limitations has not run for tax fraud on this. I would argue that this stuff affects a banking institution, um, so that it has much more than the standard three years. What are you guys doing about this? You know, in Maryland, it's a, it's a, uh, we've been in touch with the Maryland authorities. We have correspondence from the Maryland authorities. You know, are you just protect, you're, you're in the fraud protection business now? Is that what you like to do? I mean, to come to Maryland, we protect frauds. Look at <laughs> Baltimore. Look what you can get away with in Baltimore. They There's put, mayhem. Put that on the license plate. Right. The land of, the land of fraudsters and oysters. 
Right. So um, now, in terms of Rod Rosenstein, uh, we've got some links up here, uh, and I, I have some real problems with what I see in this person's record. One, he was involved in the Whitewater investigation, which to me, uh, I appreciate that it, the Whitewater investigation occurred in the beginning when Bill was president, so it was kind of tough to get him. But it, to me, that was a you know, garden variety land scam. You take a bunch of worthless dirt, you, you convince the governor to change, you try to convince the governor to make that dirt more accessible by changing the highway. That you was off, a big deal, using his position as the governor right, to right. build an off ramp on a highway to this right. worthless land. And then you get a crooked bank to say, you know, that Bubba and his wife Dottie, you know, they can get a, a, you know, a 20 year loan to buy this piece of dirt, a smaller piece of dirt, you know, and it's just interest only for the first five years and you just mark the thing up five times. I mean, it's a standard land development scam. And, and people do that all across the world, hmm. but you shouldn't be doing that as the governor of the state, the attorney general, I mean, it was first, I guess, when he was governor. And you certainly shouldn't be obstructing the investigation of that. So when I see somebody as smart as Rod Rosenstein, summa cum laude graduate from Wharton, Harvard Law School graduate, on the team that couldn't see the obvious whitewater fraud, then on the team that couldn't see the obvious travel office fraud. Right. Uh, then on the team, he gets uh, he does such a good job missing fraud that they say, <laughs> you know what? Why don't we put you into the Justice Department in charge of deciding who to get prosecuted for fraud? So right. from 2001 to 2005, when the Clinton Foundation frauds escalated from you know small beer stuff into this gigantic, you know, sending adulterated drug, possibly sending adulterated HIV drugs around the world, and international fraud, wire fraud, bank fraud, mail fraud, registration fraud, solicitation fraud, lying under oath everywhere. This st smart person with his team couldn't look at the obvious and say, hmm, yeah. I think there's a fraud here. Yeah. You know, it just, you see him in that, then you see him move from that <clears throat> to the Ramboxy thing comes to light. That's something that's embarrassing to the Bush administration and to the Obama administration and to the Clintons. You and know, that, Nicholas that, Sarkozy. And certainly Nicholas Sarkozy, but you know, we don't yet understand how much dirty Ranboxy, how much dirty generic medicine may have ended up paid for by US taxpayer dollars, may have ended up around, scattered in countries around the world where there is an HIV AIDS problem. How much dirty medicine did we pay for as taxpayers and did, why did Rod Rosenstein and the team that was on this case for something like seven years, why did it take them seven years? Admittedly, they got 500 million from Ron Boxy. Maybe they should have just shut Ron Boxy all the way down. Maybe there should have been a lot more people in prison. Maybe, you know, the Clinton Foundation fraud would have been known had Rod Rosenstein done the real good job that he should have done. And yeah. here's a guy, you know, who was in that role uh, at the same time, missing the laureate, what I, I consider to be frauds. Well, he was very eager. Oh, no, that was Schneiderman who went after Trump University. Right, right. right. So, and, and then he misses the Uranium One stuff. He misses this. He, he's a champion at missing fraud. But at what point, Charles, does it become obviously compliance with the fraud? Well, again, I'm just, I'm, and that's why I asked the question. I mean, I appreciate, you know, you, you win, you're running for president, you win. You know, maybe right. that's good news, maybe it's bad news. It's like, oh man, now I gotta work. But <laughs> anyway, you, so he wins. And, and you got these positions you gotta fill. You say, well, I need, you know, I've gotta put somebody into the Justice Department who's gonna run the place. Who should I put in? Why don't I put somebody in who is proven to be incompetent at spotting <laughs> fraud? Right. You know, that's the best. Who was putting this guy forward? Who was pushing this guy on Trump? I can forgive the Trump administration in the early heady period when everything's flying at them all at once, they're new to running the government. But who pushed for Rosenstein? Who's protecting Rosenstein? Why is that guy still on this case at all? In my view, as I say in the piece, you know, I think he should be, he's either a witness, you know, in the Clinton Foundation fraud, or maybe even a subject yeah. in the Clinton Foundation fraud. And, yeah. you know, I think it's in the crowdsource of the truth community. We need to step up, stand up, talk about this, circulate this. I think we're seeing uh, at least I'm seeing in the retweeting and the traffic that there are a lot of people focused on this. There are going to be some big pieces coming out this week, raising the temperature even higher. Good. We need that temperature to go up because it's been freezing here in New York lately. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the spring. Yeah. Okay. So back to...
Ooh. This is just to show it's not simply right wing uh, talking points here. Uh, the left wing, Los Angeles Times, has noticed some of this. Um, you can go back into the slides and we'll rush along here. Oh, sorry, I just want to show the LA Times. That's okay. Um, and let's not, uh, I think I made the Rosenstein points. We can go to the <coughs> Sydney Powell. Uh, is a wonderful human being. This book we promote from time to time. Um, you know, it really, it, it's odd. Look, it's all five-star reviews, which I think is great. None of them from Hillary. <laughs> yeah. Ah, see, that, that makes sense. That it's heavily weighted towards yeah. five stars. Everybody likes it. With Hillary, uh, uh, it would be upside down. Uh, and right, still be, all here and she get a five-star. But if right. we go down, let's just see what, if there are any interesting view, uh, reviews. Here. Exposing injustice. Yeah, it's really, it's, she, she's a wonderful human being. I've had the privilege of meeting her several times. Uh, you would not want to be on the wrong side of Sidney Powell. She's very, very thorough. And she's one of these people who loves the law and is uh, extremely upset about the fact that uh, under Republicans and Democrats, the, the Department of Justice has had serious problems. And she cites ad nauseum. Mueller as being a problem, Weissman as being a problem. Mueller is a huge problem. I kind of can't get past that. I really object to uh, his FBI's investigation of 9-11, the fact that the 28-page uh, Senate Intelligence Committee report that uh, Senator Bob Graham, champ Graham championed for many, many years didn't come out for 16 years, or sorry, 15 years, came out in 2016. It was completed in the end of 2001. Mueller had to know about it, implicated all kinds of people. I have now finally seen evidence that there were some Israeli students that were involved somehow. They were whisked back to Israel. There's all these unanswered questions about 9-11, which Robert Mueller presided over. He is a bad hombre. Yeah. I mean, it's enough of this. So if we, if we go back into uh, the slides, <clears throat> uh, you know, that's, if, if we hit this Wikipedia thing on James Comey, mm. we'll see. <clears throat> that's the definition of dopey. There he is. And if we go to down, the slide down. dopey. Yeah, down the right. He's, look when he was director of the FBI, September 4, 2013 to May 9, 2017, right? Yep. So through May 9th, 2017, if we keep going down a little bit, you say preceded by Robert Mueller, we hit that one. Not no Mueller, yeah. And Robert Swan Mueller. That's interesting. That's his middle name, Swan. Yeah. The third. Uh, we keep go down there. It'll show how long he was there. He was September he was appointed 4. Appointed by Rosenstein. Right. right. Oh, but that's that's as that's his special counsel. Yeah. Right, 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 right. But here we have. Um, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation from September 4, 2001 to September 4, 2013. Now, in the period, I want to say in like three or four through five, um, Rod, uh, Rod Rosenstein is now Deputy Attorney General of the, of, of the United States. Comey was Deputy Attorney General of the United States back mm, in two. This is a revolving door at the yeah. Justice Department. And it, it just, uh, I mean, to me, uh, problems as serious as these are, whether Foreign actors colluded or interfered in the elections of 2016, and I would add 2014 and 12 and 10 and whatever. It wouldn't just be for me an inquiry into 2016 and 15. Uh, these are serious questions that should be answered, asked and answered by serious people, not by people who, you know, even if, let's say, by some miracle, Mueller, Mueller issues his report and says, you know what? Barack Obama, Valerie Jarrett, Joe Biden, and their families, and Hillary Clinton, the Clinton, they're all going, you know, Corinne Brown, we're releasing you from prison, and the whole kit and caboodle of all the people that we've been chasing for a long time, you're going to, you know, break rocks up in mosquito-infested, <laughs> fly-infested Alaska for the one month a year in that prison where it's warm, and then you're going to make ice cubes for the balance. You know, even if he did that, because of all these conflicts, people are going to say, you know, you know, was this really a straight, straight uh, analysis here? And I think that's, at root, a very serious set of problems that has to be addressed imminently. Absolutely. I think they should take those people and put them into the uh, underground prison that Harmon Wilfred had to stay in for four months. Let's see how they like that. Yeah, I'd send them to the same one in Cairo, which I walked over one day. 
There's an underground prison in Cairo. Downtown Cairo. You can hear the people yelling out from the manhole covers. That was that was that back in 1975. Wow. And it wasn't air conditioned. I wouldn't think so, <laughs> but I guess that's a deterrent to crime if you ever wanted one. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, how could the FBI? You know, how, you tell me there's nobody in the FBI who saw all these problems. Here's a story from 2016 alleging that there were 150 agents looking at the Clinton email probe. How could none of these people have asked the question, you know, we've got this secret server and these secret devices. You know, how did Hillary Clinton and her team, where are the records in the State Department? Bleach pit. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> No, but there's got to be some records. I mean, in the old days, you know, well, there have to be duplicate, triplicate, you know, the way the government works. You can't just have one record. She, she couldn't have gotten to every single record. You know, if you have 150 agents looking at things, there have to be files here. And it just doesn't make any sense to me that we would spend, as we do, $6 trillion a year on government, all levels, and have, you know, a system that would appear to be so easily gamed. Well, there's a lot of that going around, Charles. People like to game systems. Yeah. And that's the look of somebody who just thinks that we're all equal. She's not arrogant. Not in the slightest. You know, she rigged the election. She helped launder billions of dollars around the world, has created wars and destruction and misery all around the world. But at this point, what difference <laughs> does it make anyhow? That's a good one. <laughs> Anyway, Mrs. Clinton, boy. So um, we have this WikiLeaks here. Oh. What was, you keep bringing it up and we never get to the details. Here's this cable of Robert Mueller delivering highly enriched stolen uranium to Russia in 2009. Now, I, hmm. I really want to understand that one. How you know, did first, where did this stolen uranium come from? Yes. You know, is this uranium one informant stuff? And, you know, why did, did it fall to Robert Mueller to bring it to Russia? Mueller. <laughs> what, uh -oh. what just happened? I don't know what happened. Let's see if we can get that back. There, there we you go. go. Uranium is a very dangerous substance, right, Charles? It's radioactive. Uh, we've in the past received information that it might have been illegally transported, its depleted form might have been illegally transported on Maersk vessels. That came to us from a retired military source and was corroborated by a news article, I think in the Atlantic, that a Maersk vessel had run aground in uh, Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, mm -hmm. might have been Bangladesh, where the government detected dangerous levels of radiation there. So a lot of reason to be cautious if you even have a suspicion that uranium might be present somewhere where the proper safety protocols are in place. If they are not in place, that is, it's important to alert the proper authorities to make sure that that's not incorrect or uh, possibly a danger to the public. Yeah, so th these are taken from the, I think, the, the uh, Secretary of State or State Department cables. But um, a timeline needs to be put together here, not treating the uh, Uranium One matter as a separate investigation, not treating Anna Chapman as a separate thing and the Clinton Foundation as a separate thing. It's all one thing. Hmm. And you know, we need to go through, we pay a lot of money as Americans for our government. We're not getting what we deserve. We need answers here. There's obvious corruption. It's trying to, people are trying to cover it up and it's time to uncover it is trying to let the, let the American people understand what was done behind our backs. We're all, you know, n none of these captains of government, you know, are that much smarter than the average man in the street. And it's time for us to know the truth. It's for the truth to be crowdsourced and fully exposed. Now, Charles, just so people know what we're looking at here, this is from a WikiLeaks release of diplomatic cables, right? Right, right. And this has been, this has never been denied. This is authentic material where the FSB, which is obviously the Russian uh, agency that replaced the KGB, this is like the, the federal whatever, uh, is clearing with the Russian Ministry of Aviation a flight with Robert Mueller and uranium. And this is on September 21st, 2009. 
Okay, now September 21st happens to be seven, uh, let's see, three days before, or no, eight days before uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative was created on the 29th of September 2009. Hmm. So there's, he's messing around, Mueller personally is messing around with uranium, delivering it to, to Russia. Uh, we have this Uranium One informant. We have a stalled investigation into Uranium One. We have an illegal reorganization of the Clinton Foundation going on. We have a lot of very smart people in the FBI who must have seen all this stuff, must have been aware of all these crazy trips and agreements the Clinton Foundation was entering into around the world, yet nothing happened. It's almost as if you know, the Clintons were given you know, a prospective get out of jail free card. Maybe you know, that's what happens when you, you get a small pension, a couple hundred thousand, but the big deal is that you get, you can break any laws you want as a former <laughs> president, you know, you can do what you want. There's money to be made if you're in that business. Yeah, Charles. you're, you're yeah. a protected criminal. I, you know, I've thought often about the saying that crime doesn't pay, and I think that's wrong. Yeah. It would have gone out of business long ago if that were true. Well, that was so last millennium. Yeah. So, and, and then on this um, final link on the page, now we're going to get into the foundation stuff, but the papers that were uh, on the Anna Chapman uh, matter, for, first dr dribbling out of the papers, occurred before the 2012 election. This is quite interesting to me. They were dribbled out on... Halloween 2011, hmm. suggesting to me that there are elements within the FBI who didn't like what happened there with that exchange, the unequal exchange, where we got far less in the way of, you know, Americans back for the spy, many spies we let out of this country. And, you know, I, I really, this just sticks in my craw. I don't understand why it took so long to round this spy ring up. I don't understand why the, the, the spies weren't debriefed. I don't understand why we rushed them quickly back to, to, to Russia. I don't understand why Skripal uh, was released not to us but to the UK. And I think, you know, enough of this. We need to know really what was happening here. And, and it's now seven years, what is it, seven years later, almost. Uh, we could take the truth and let's hear it. What yeah. happened? Not this kind of what happened. Like. <laughs> Really what happened. The real, the real what happened, the real deal of what happened. Yeah, from the real deal university. So um, I think, you know, when people now reflect on this, people who have the time to think about these many scandals, they understand the rot runs deep. So now I want to take you through. This is, this is a very simple and quick way to say that the Clinton Foundation is a hopeless fraud. And let me explain this to you. Um, a, 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 a charity cannot be an individual. It cannot be a collection of individuals, what's called a formless aggregation. It has to be an actual entity, separate and apart from the individual. So it has to be an association, a trust, or a corporation. In the case of the Clinton Foundation, they claimed that this thing uh, was an actual nonprofit corporation. To be a validly constructed nonprofit corporation, you have to follow you start by following the laws of the state in which you were incorporated, which are the lawless state of Arkansas. So they actually do have a great you know, law called the Nonprofit Corporate Corporation Act of 1993, which is very explicit and, and lays out. We've provided links to the, the, uh, the way in which uh, the laws that are followed or should be followed in Arkansas. Yeah. And we don't need to hit that link quite yet on the blue one there on the right, but that is a pathway to the application or portions of the application that, um, that was tendered into the IRS on the 23rd of December 1997. But the question is, did they actually create an organization on October 23, 1997? Just because your lawyers, you know, signed papers, does it mean that the actual real directors that were Skip Rutherford, David Pryor, and uh, Ann Jordan, Vernon Jordan's wife, doesn't mean that they came together by October 23, 1997 and actually held a board meeting where they, they adopted the Articles of Incorporation, amended them with their signatures, you know, considered issues, uh, opened bank accounts, uh, applied for uh, an employer identification number so they could employ people and comply with other things. Doesn't mean they did all that on October 23, 1997. And indeed, in step two, there's no proof that I've been able to see that they actually did that. But magically, before the 23rd of December, 1997, 
they were able to obtain a post office box. Now, the only way you can do that as a corporation is if you say to the post office, hey, I'm a corporation. <laughs> you know, I've done the work that you're supposed to do. But they, I don't think they did that work. In addition, in Arkansas, you have to file, it's not just federal paperwork you have to file, you have to file state paperwork. We found no evidence that the required tax and other forms that needed to be filed in Arkansas were in fact filed promptly after the, the October 23, 1997. Hmm. So there is a set of bylaws, again, uh, it's I think unsigned from memory on the 23rd of December, 1997. Now bylaws are not the controlling legal document when it I'm told by lawyers, when it comes to a corporation, a, a charity, it's the articles of incorporation that matter the most. Bylaws are sort of like rules for running the, the place. They have to comply with the uh, relevant statutes in the state. Uh, but there's no evidence that the, the directors actually, that they held a board meeting and they actually adopted these bylaws formally. And there is rich evidence in step five that they had not applied for this employer identification number. And we've looked at it and you can get an employer identification number promptly. Right, you can get it. Yeah, it's not I hard. I think to, you get it on the website. It, it, well, it, back in '97, you got it on the telephone, right. and and you could get it instantly. So yeah. why did they wait 62 days to apply for one? Why did they? I think because they wanted to avoid, in theory, filing a tax return for 1997. Now, in this period, we're going to go through this in some depth on another presentation. Wait, can I just guess something? Sure. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Between October 23rd, 1997, and December 23rd, 1997. What was going on? What was happening? October 1997, uh, well, Bill Clinton running for... Monica Lewinsky oh. was, you know, making noises. Buying maybe I'll cooperate, yeah, maybe I'll cooperate, maybe I won't cooperate, getting people were being interviewed. You know, this hmm. is right in the time frame where the heat was rising bigly, as Trump would say, President Trump would say, uh, against Bill Clinton and his various minions we're seeing what they could do to find better jobs for Monica Lewinsky to get her to try to, to lie under oath. This is exactly the same time frame when we're doing all this, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they, they put in a, an estimate of how the thing would perform for the last eight days of 1997 in that blue link in the upper right. And it shows, don't go to the link, it shows $10,000 of revenue for 1997, of incoming uh, contributions in 1997. So you're making an estimate, you're that dumb. You got eight days left uh, of the year and you put your application in. It's a lengthy amount of work. Somebody spent a lot of time on this. Who, are, who is actually working on this? You have no employees because you haven't filed uh, for a federal employer identification number. Yeah, you, you can't pay people right. and stuff. So you, who's running up the expenses? I mean, who? Where's the, federal yeah. where's the corporate authority to do any of that? And you got the dumbest estimator in the world sending something under oath, uh, under penalties of perjury, across state lines, into the, into the IRS, wherever, the Cincinnati office, I think, the famous Cincinnati office that gets people in trouble, uh, saying that you're going to have $10,000 of revenue and you're going to incur expenses. And you never file a tax return for 1997 as you were required to do. You obtain this determination letter from the IRS, as we're going to show you, on the basis of false and materially misleading statements. The best okay. kind. And this letter is effective back to the 23rd of October 1997. So the IRS thought you existed. You represented the IRS that you existed. So you have to tell the public what were your real expenses and your real revenues in this short period of October 23, 1997 to uh, 31 December 97. Now, this is important because um, the biggest donor, we'll get into this, the biggest reported donor in 1998 gave 2.3 million. And my strong suspicion is that money came from the presidential inaugural trust that was supposed to, I believe, file a report 90 days after the inauguration in 1997, so whatever that makes it being 90 days would put you into April uh, of 1997, before this whole mess started. They were supposed to account for all their money, right? And what happened to that money? I don't know. You know, uh, well, my suspicion is that, you know, maybe not all of it was dispersed the way it was supposed to. Maybe some went off into the wilderness 
And these with the Chardonnay, with the Chardonnay, and you know, with a, the Energizer or, or whoever her you know predecessor was, and so this is stuff that you know. Had I been on a team with the FBI, you know, rather than calling new witnesses, I'd say, "What's in our files? What you IRS give us the file? What do you have in this? You know, what did they declare to the IRS as having been spent and earned? And let's then, once we have what we can easily get, we'll go to the, raid the charity. We'll get all its books." Um, they have failed to file a tax return for 1997. They'll probably try to argue we didn't have enough revenue. Well, if you had an understanding with the second presidential inaugural trust that you were going to get up to $2.3 million, you had revenue in 1997 and it should have been declared in 1997. So the other thing that happened in this time frame is that they had to shut down the first presidential expense trust by December 30th, 1997. And who? Why? because this bag man, Charlie Tree, was revealed as possibly being an agent for foreign people, uh, put it, contributing money illegally to this legal expense trust. So they had to shut it down, and they then had to ramp up a second presidential exp expense, expense trust. So to summarize, the biggest donor we're going to show you into, the, into 1998, the biggest declared donor was run by one of the Clinton Foundation, one of the three Clinton Foundation uh, directors. Ann Jordan, and they have, she had never declared that relationship either in the, nine, in the application for federal tax exemption or in numerous state registration forms which were filed in 1998 where she had to explain that over two-thirds of the declared amount of money that went into the Clinton Foundation in 1998 went from this suspect presidential inaugural trust which she jointly controlled. That's one thing that you know, wasn't declared. The st second thing that wasn't declared is that the, David Pryor, the other director, was the person who was chairing this thing. And he didn't declare that in the, nine, in the application for federal tax exemption, in applications for state tax exemptions. In other presentations, we're going to show you that, that he registered, people registered on, uh, on his behalf. This thing, which certainly was not a charity, as a putative charity in Oklahoma and in Maryland, uh, when it certainly wasn't a charity. We have correspondence from the Maryland uh, charity unit in the Attorney General's office saying, this isn't a charity. What's this <laughs> doing here? Um, so you have numerous misstatements and omissions on federal and state filings sent using the mails. Um, and I don't know how that came up, but... No? Okay. That was in there. Or that you do want to keep. This is, this, I just want to focus for a second on this. This is a copy of, obtained from the Clinton Foundation website. And what does it say J in line 1A, Jason? What does it say is the name? The William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. Note the, the, the use of the word the, okay? That's it, that, this is the full legal name, as shown in the organizing document, okay? You can't just say, well, I'm now gonna call it in one state, why don't I call it the J. Clinton Presidential Foundation? Another state I'll call it the William J. Clinton. Another state I'll call it the, the whole name. Maybe I'll just call it the Clinton Presidential. You can't do that. When it says you're filing, you know, you can't break any law, state, local, foreign, federal, whatever. Williams and Connolly, we're gonna get into that in a second. You notice the address they cite is this post office box. This form is dated and signed under penalties of perjury 23 December 2000 sorry, 1997, how did it obtain this post office box without a federal employer identica identification number? How did it do that? How did it transact business for 62 days from October 23, 1997 until they filed this form? How did they do that? The uh -huh. answer is they probably didn't do that. So keep on going well, down wait, here. So, so what does that indicate, that this document is fraudulently no, filed? And here's the man's signature. It indicates, and he says here, I declare under the penalties of perjury, blah, blah, blah. Remember the whole point I said, you can't be a formless aggregation. If you want to maintain the fiction that you are a real nonprofit corporation, you've got to do things by the book. You've got to have meetings. You've got to obtain authority. You've got to make truthful declarations. You can't have a record as sluggish as this. Hmm. You know, this is, we haven't even gotten, you know, two months into the existence of this thing. And, and it's already it, It's already fraud. a mess. Yeah. But if you, if you go down a little bit further, you see you have to talk about the activities and operate and additional information. Uh, keep on going. And uh, keep on going to the next page. Here are the directors. You see, you're supposed to explain 
any of any um, David relationships. David Pryor, Andrew. They don't explain any of these. Do they serve? Do any of the above persons serve as members of the governing body by reason of being public officials? No. How about are they are they insiders? The answer is they are. Actually, I would argue. What does that mean? They work for well that organizations to which they have ties are doing business with the Clinton Foundation. Got it. And then. Is it controlled by anybody else? No. Now look here. Six. Does or will the organization directly or indirectly engage in any of the following transactions with any political organization? Let's just think about political organizations. Hillary Clinton's senatorial campaign. <laughs> Democratic National Committee. Presidential Expense Trust. You know, uh, Inaugural Committee. And no. We don't, even though we do, right? So if we go back into the slide, um, and go, we actually go to the next page. All right, we've covered some of this. In red, they use, it's very important to focus on the use of the word the in the name, that is the real name of this thing. You can't use a different name when you're registering across state lines and various organizations. I would argue that address, the post office box 1104, is a fake address. Not, and, even, not even a post office box? Well, I think they had it, but I don't think they, I, I question who obtained it. If, if Skip Rutherford, the president of the foundation, obtained it using his personal social security number, um, then, he, then there's a problem. See, I think you and I sometimes use the word fake in the same way. It could be a real post office box that's actually a tangible post office box, but it represents something other than what they want you to think. Right, right. And, and the, the problem with that is when you obtain one of these post office boxes, you've got to keep the post office up to date about changes in your organization as time passes. And of course they didn't do that. What about a post office box at a private company? Like they have you know, mailboxes, et cetera, and Post Box USA and all these private companies. Do they have the same rules? Are they the post office I, or I, it's not I, a? I don't know. I don't, I, they have a different set of rules. I don't know how similar they may be. But, but if you got a post office box at the actual United States post office. You're in trouble. Right. You're, you're, it's a federal thing. It's a, you're in big trouble. Right. Now, we skipped over, we, we covered this idea of spending 62 days without an EIN, that's a problem. The activity codes that they um, listed, you'll see what they said, 061, a library, 062, an historical site, records or reenactment, and 124, study and research, non-scientific, okay? That's what they're approved to do, okay? Those three things. If we go back into, here's the instructions to be really you know, well, I hate to use the word, but to be anal about it, that's the actual set of forms that they should have been following when we get this link up. This is the one you see here, revised April 1996. If we go to the last page, these are all the instructions, they're very lengthy. We get to the, there you go. These are, if you make it smaller actually, a little bit. These are all of the activity codes they could have picked. They had to pick three, mm -hmm. okay? They picked 6-1, library, 6-2, historical site, and 1-2-4, which is a little bit further down, 1-2-4, study and research, non-scientific, right? Now, is climate change scientific or non-scientific? I suppose well, it's a Studying bigger... it would be scientific. Right, well, so you can't do client, climate change here. You can't do fighting HIV and AIDS with these codes, right? You oh. can't to look at code 910. What does that say? Uh, a domestic organization with activities outside the United States. Did they check that code? I'm going to say probably no. No, you know. 061, 062, 124. Those are the codes they picked. So right? they, they didn't they, pick international. They don't know the code. They, they, you know, so they knowingly selected the right to do a library, records, and study non-scientific. What's the code for mini golf? <laughs> I don't know. But these, these, these are activities that are permitted by a charity. Right. right? Yeah. You know, mutual ditch irrigation telephone electric company or like organization. Is that that's a real a thing? What's it a says, mutual ditch? That's a common ditch. <laughs> Our mutual ditch. Perhaps we should start the Char Charles Ortel Common Ditch Foundation. <laughs> no, Throw your money in the ditch. That's right. <laughs> 
Oh, man. That's so, pretty funny, Charles. So, you know, there, there are a lot. People say there, is, there aren't records. There are a lot of records. Now, right. we haven't, be, we haven't um, found proof. The first place where they should have filed for state tax exemption is in Arkansas, right? You, yeah. You get rights from the, federal, uh, the IRS to be exclu uh, exempt from federal taxes. If you want to be exempt from Arkansas's taxes, and I, at the time, I want to say their corporate income tax was 6%. They have other taxes. Um, you've got to file for Arkansas tax exemption. So, you know, Mr. Rosenstein and the team and FBI, whatever, you're looking at this back in 2001, you say, all right, I'm going to ask the foundation for their records. <laughs> you know, where did you file for, you know, tax exemption? In what states, you know? And yeah. if you didn't file in a bunch of states, you're dead. <laughs> so, um, if we go to the next page, we're rip-roaring along here. Okay, this is... We're now going to talk about their first filing. They skipped the 97 report. I would argue they should have filed a 97 report. And we don't need to hit this one, but people are interested later. This is the actual, no, no it's for some reason, the next page, yeah. This is the, these are the instructions for the forms as, they were, as the instructions were written for the 1998 form, okay? So Change we're being from as year to year. yeah, because the form changes. So so we're being a, as anal as possible to show you these are the real instructions. You don't look at the 2017 instructions and say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, you got to look at the 1998 instructions. Now, what address do they put in? It's a f item C. It's one of the first things in the front before you get into the parts of the tax return. What is wrong with what's there in red? Well, it's the same PO box as it doesn't have the exactly. So. And you know, the, Bill Clinton is somebody who quibbled about the wor use of the word is. is. Yes, it depends okay. on what your definition of the word the is. is. But you can't see, this is so <laughs> tricky. And this is, this, but this is, it's funny, but it's, it's really not funny. It's when back in the day, back in 1998 and 99, these forms were filed in 99, 498. Um, we obviously had, didn't have September 11th, 2001. We didn't right. have. Um, you know, the same level of scrutiny of opening bank accounts yeah. that we now do. But when you take a presidential foundation and you start playing fast and loose with the rules, and you don't even get your name exactly right, you know, then it, it just tells somebody who's careful and a donor who might be wa wanting to give money to this. These are not careful people, but this, this is the beginning of a pathway of, of crime here that you would, in your first tax return, it's not like you can say, you know, I can make three mistakes on the return. You know, everything on this return has to be correct. You don't even get your own damn name right. Yeah, and I say that that cannot possibly be a mistake. Right. That is the type of thing that companies are very sensitive about. They even spoke about that in the Facebook movie, The Social Network, where he says, don't call it the Facebook, just call it right. Facebook. Right. So there is a big difference in branding right. and company right. identity. They'd be very sensitive to that, I think. Right, and, and also, we're gonna have some fun here in a second. Uh, and mind you, this is all we're doing here is focusing on 98 and certain acti activities that happened in 99. This pattern gets wider and wider and more deliberate, more bold. Yeah. Um, they say in part two, they list out, in, they're asked in other expenses, you know, they specifically state that they spent $6,512 on state registration fees, right? I didn't say that, that's what they said. Then you go to a different section of the return if we make it smaller, part six, Line 98, list of states, list each state with which the organization is filing a copy of this return in full or partial satisfaction of state filing requirements. None. So why did you spend $6,512 on state registration fees to file no registrations? No, well, that was just, you know, travel and uh, expenses. Exactly. Food and entertainment. So on the question that I raised earlier of is this a validly constructed organization or is it a fiction? Is it a formless aggregation? List the number of employees. Enter the number of employees on your payroll during the pay period, including March 12, 1998. None. So it has no FEIN when it gets its post office box. It's not getting its name right. It's lying about its registrations, and it has no employees. Other than that, there's ample proof that this thing is a real organization at this point, right? <laughs> then. It's filed six, spent $6,512 to register in umpty state states, but they didn't register, they claim. 
And then in 365 days of working, you know, get up first thing in the morning, thinking about this presidential foundation, they gotta raise money for the presidential foundation. Wait a minute, what was going on in 1998? What was going on in 1998 is Bill Clinton was getting in hotter and hotter water. He was impeached late in 1998, and it must have been rather difficult to get money into a foundation if you're wondering, is the guy gonna be kicked out of office, maybe being a slammer, why would anybody want to, you know, I paid for the foundation stone for the first person to be convicted. He wasn't convicted in the Senate, but, you know, there was a possibility that he might be convicted. And we didn't know during 1998 what could have happened. So you're, you're, you're registering, oh, no states you claim, but you spent all this money. And then you have three donations only, only three. That's all you had. Mm. You've got the man's a sitting president of the United States. You've got the, you know, Terry McAuliffe and the, the Democratic fan machine and the mainstream media say, oh, this is so unfair, it's all about sex. And all they raise, these prolific fundraisers, are three donations, one from the presidential second inaugural uh, committee, 2.3 million in my view, one for $500,000 and one for $250,000. This is just so far away from being what really happened. Hmm. And again, you could have seen this Mr. Rosenstein, between 2001 and 2005, when you spent four years looking into this and missed this, you could have seen this at the FBI. Somebody probably did see this. So who told the FBI team to stand down? You know, that, I think that's a big set of questions. If we make this a little smaller. So um, the, the FBI has all of these, if we hit this one here. Top one? Yeah. That's, that's the actual filing for uh, the, their 990. You see here? They say it's the initial return. It, it's not the initial return. The initial return should have been for 23 October 1997 to 31 December 1997. So they omitted a return, okay? They used the wrong name. No the. No the. Same P.O. box though. S questionable P.O. box, right? There's supposed to be an audit. It's $3 million of revenue. There's no audit that I see anywhere, okay? And we could go on and on and on, but we provided you a link here so you can see. I mean, look at the expenses, right? $149,000 of total expenses, right? $6,512 were for um, state registration. So that's a material amount. I mean, either you'd spent the money or you didn't spend the money. Did you register or didn't you register? The answer is, we're gonna show you in a second that they did register but they said they didn't. <clears throat> and they filed this on May 9th, 1999. As you see there, it was sent across state lines Ogden. from Arkansas into Ogden, Utah. Hmm. So if we go back into the slides, um, if we hit this contr co contributors list thing here. Oh, I think I might hit the same thing. No, no, that's it. And then we go a little bit down the page. Look at the one to five million, hit the blue arrow one to five million. Next one, yep. Go to page two. Where is it? Is it's it it's the very bottom. Next, go to page two. And scroll down the page a little bit. And it says something like, uh, slowly here. Presidential Inaugural Committee, one to five million. And if we think about it, if, if this is correct, right? A lot of and bills. the presidential inaugural committee gave one to five million, that means it couldn't have given 250,000, it couldn't have given 500,000, it had to be the $2.3 million donor, if this is correct. Now, saying that something out of the Clinton Foundation is correct is not yeah. the safest assumption to make in the world, but I think, you know, this is a slam dunk. The FBI should be going right in and saying to the IRS, to the Clinton Foundation, show us who gave you this money, on what date did they give, us, give you the money, and provide an accounting to the Presidential Inaugural Committee of all your spending. <clears throat> hmm. So if we go to the next page. All right, here are some examples. We have not found anything. Here are 10 examples of registrations that are available one way or another at the various locations. And note the different ways in which they were. On the 19th of May, 1998, they registered in California using 
the, the right name. We don't know what name they used in New York. Now, why would they register in these states first? Because these are states where rich people live, who would like to give money and are allies of the Clintons. So, yeah, are you telling me that you went to the bother, Clintons, of registering in these states before Bill was impeached, right? Not convicted, but impeached. And you didn't raise one bean in California? One bean in New York? Charles, was he impeached for lying about the Monica Lewinsky thing? He was impeached for lying under oath and obstructing justice. Now, impeach, to the simple way to think about impeachment, I'm told by lawyers, impeaching is the equivalent of being indicted. It doesn't right. mean you're guilty of the crime. It means that uh, people have thought about it and said, <clears throat> the balance of you know, the evidence, the weight of the evidence, this is something that looks, sure looks to us like a crime could have been convicted, uh, could have happened, and we need to now um, go ahead and challenge it. But it was lying under oath about Monica? No, it was lying under oath uh, in, 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 for various reasons. I don't know about if it was just Monica. Hmm. But the point is, you don't, it's not like you, you can lie. There's nothing in the law that says, well, if it's embarrassing, you can lie about it. Right. You know, if it's a sexual matter, of course, you can, everybody lies about that. Some, no. Somebody once told me, oh, I lied to you because I, I thought the truth would upset you. And I was like, uh, I think that's the reason they invented lying. So that doesn't really work as an excuse. <laughs> so, so then you look here in, in, in these other things. You have on the 28th of July in Minnesota, they send a registration across state lines into Minnesota. And they say the name of it is the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. And here's the kicker. In, in Minnesota... And I think in Michigan, which for some reason I don't have Michigan up as another state. I, we need to get Michigan in here. So there are 11 states. Both in Minnesota and in Michigan, they claim the reason we're not providing you information about the previous, previous year, 1997, is they because we... thought the truth would upset you. Yeah, it's because <laughs> we didn't exist in 97. Right. That's what they say. The same Skip Rutherford, the second dean of the Clinton School of Public Service, you know, he says the IRS... We existed from October 23, 1997. He then says to Minnesota, actually, we didn't exist in 1997. And Pryor, I think, David Pryor signs a similar thing. Hmm. And you notice they use this Hawthorne Road address, which is Skip Rutherford's home address for all these other filings. Really? So you have. Why do they do that? <clears throat> well, I think what they were trying to do here is to get as many different bank accounts as possible. Huh. And to have wow. people send money you know, various places. And then, you know, if you've got a friendly banker and you've got this big stack of checks you want to cash and put it into an account, a checking account that's not costing the bank, is actually earning the bank money. Hmm. A, a local bank in Arkansas, if there were a crooked one in Arkansas, there are crooked ones in New York. I'm sure there are crooked ones in everywhere. A branch manager says, you know what, this is a pretty good deal. I've got all this money coming in here. It's going to go into a checking account. We don't have to pay anything. We, will, we can take this money and lend it out. You know? Can I ask you something, Charles? Would you say that the work that you're doing day to day, studying the frauds of the Clintons and all that, is substantially different than the work that you did in your uh, Wall Street career? Well, it, it was problem solving. I mean, it's a lot more. But that's what I'm getting at. It's it's different, but yet your approach is the same. Your techniques are the same. Your diligence in doing the work. You probably use a lot of the same techniques to do, you're not investing anything here, you're not buying companies here. I'm but, certainly not investing in this. But I'm saying <laughs> your process is very similar even though what you're doing is substantially different. And what I'm getting at is we see fake addresses, fake P.O. boxes, changing names. This is the same exact technique that's being used by the people who don't want this information to get out to attack online. They change names, yep. they use false identities, fake information, it's the same. Right, it's exactly right, Jason. And, and so, but th this is, you know, there are various fraud warning sites at the FBI and elsewhere, state attorneys general, and they all talk about this kind of stuff. You see a foundation that is using slightly similar names that sound good, presidential, Clinton, <laughs> you know, and it's, oh, this is pretty interesting here. And you notice they're registering in states with the exception of uh, South Carolina and Ohio and New Hampshire. Well, many of these states are Democratic, big Democratic mm. leading states. So they needed to raise money like crazy. Mm -hmm. Why did they need to raise, raise money in 1998? Because 
they had huge legal bills in connection with many things, but especially mm -hmm. then including impeachment. Who was defending the Clintons in the or bill in the impeachment process? Was Williams it? and Connolly, which is the very law Craig? firm. Hmm? Gregory Craig? Gregory Craig? I don't know if he, he might have been involved, actually, yeah. But What's I the think name of the law firm? He, Williams and Connolly. It was uh, David Kendall. Gregory Craig, I think, was, was a personal lawyer on a different matter. But William, stand Williams and Connolly for a second, because Williams and Connolly are the people to whom the Clintons were in major league debt. They're the people, the law firm, that do this filing to create this uh, tax-exempt organization on December 23, 1997. Two out of the three signature, signatures on those forms are Williams and Connolly. Well, it says here, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is important because this crosses over into Mr. Wilfred's story. It says right here, Gregory Craig is there a former go. attorney at the law firm of Williams and Connolly. So again, we see how birds of a fraudulent feather seem to flock together. And nest together. And that's why they don't want Harmon Wilfred to tell you his story that is backed by incredibly compelling evidence and firsthand testimony and letters from these people. Gregory Craig, you're a very bad dude. <laughs> you shouldn't be that dude. Should not, don't be that dude. Anyway, sorry, Charles. That's had all to, right. Had to bring that up. It's good, it's good. So, um, we don't yet know exactly what was claimed on the state forms. We don't yet know uh, in New York and in, in Oklahoma, but we have all these other state forms. And we have for many of these states multiple additional state forms. What you have to do in many states when you register is you have to say what is your real name and what are, list every other name that you might use and list every other branch, chapter, affiliate, or office. You're supposed to do all that. And of course they don't do that. That's how the Clintons roll. Laws are for little people. Yeah. You know? And here, we don't need no stinking laws. Yeah. So um, if we go to this uh, New York State link here, that one, yeah. Mr. Schneiderman does have, uh, does us the good grace of, you know, providing uh, links to the regulations. Hit, if you hit the middle one, middle I one. I do love this charitiesnys.com website. Look, it's 36 pages of regulations, it, just in New York State. Wow. Okay. And, of course, they didn't follow any of them. That's almost as long as Robert David Steele's amended complaint. So I guess he could read that many pages if he chose to, <laughs> but he doesn't. <laughs> there you go. So we go back into the slide. Um, people tell me that... Oh, button um, again. What? Sorry. Sometimes I try to switch to the slides and I hit the wrong button. I'll bring it right back. Okay. Um, There's the slides. All right, at the very bottom here, somebody explained to me that um, you can follow, it, it's possible to find out who owned a post office. And I think it'd be very curious, I'd be very curious to know. Owned the post office? Who owned the post office box or who, who oh. filed to get the post office box. I'd like to know for post office box 1104 in Little Rock 72203, when was that post office box actually procured? And this, this article tells you how to do it. There are probably experts in the crowd who can help us here. We need mm. to take, there are lots of post office bucks. We're not, we're not talking today about the Baltimore one with the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund. We're not talking today about the post office box 104, very similar to the 1104 that was uh, created. We don't yet know when for the Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS initiative. Mm. Uh, that was by 2004, May 2004, they had that post office box. Mm. Um, there are many, many post office boxes that this, this entity has had around the country and around the world. And we're going to get to the bottom of that. They love post office boxes, Charles. They do. So if we go to uh, the final page here, the mm. next page. Starting to happen. Yeah, so people recently were saying to us, you know, nothing's happening. And we had to point out to them, eh, you got the leader of South Korea is in prison. France is going to go to prison, maybe. Brazil just reported to prison. And in Saudi Arabia, following the sword dance of May, or whenever it was, late May 2017, <clears throat> we've got a lot of people who, you know, spent time in a makeshift prison and coughed up, it's rumored, $100 billion. Right. We don't yet know how much <clears throat> information 
those people are sending back our way to the FBI, to the, the good people at the FBI, and there are many of them, mm -hmm. uh, who are trying to get to the bottom of these frauds and expose them. We know that, in particular, I want to shout out to Sean Hannity and Judge Jeanine Pirro, because they have been doing a lot of great stuff uh, trying to expose the full contours of this fraud. They're relentless, they have resources, <clears throat> and they're doing, they're making great progress. What we're trying to do is to bring greater focus on all these things, international, push the federal people, but also push the state people, and again, shameless promotion, we hit that third link. <clears throat> this is um, an article concentrating about problems the Clintons have in every state, but with a particular focus on New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, there's a special rule against insider dealing hmm. involving transactions greater than $5,000 in a year. And those have to be noticed to the public through newspaper ads before they're adopted. There's special voting procedures. And of course, the Clintons did none of that. Hmm. So that's just New Hampshire. We're gonna be picking off state by state, writing these articles, uh, putting pressure on the attorneys general to do the jobs they should do. The Clinton family illegally took control of the parent, now called Bill Hillary Chelsea Clinton Foundation, on November 2nd, 2013. This transaction explains that in some depth. Uh, this, I'm sorry, this article explains that in some depth. Uh, we go back into the slides. Um, people are always saying, you know, oh, well, give me an example of a law. And I thought this was hysterical. I mean, this is, you know, the greater power just keeping us all in line here. This is an actual, excerpt from the U.S. Attorney's uh, Manual uh, citing legal precedents, precedents on mail fraud. One, a very important precedent is what? It's in red there. Well, something about a schmuck. Schmuck versus the United States. What the hell is that? That's the name of a case that, that's relevant. That, that's got to be a case against George's brother where he was sending <laughs> around fraudulent mail to try to implicate... Uh, uh, Nathan Stoltman, that's like schmuck versus schmuck. Right. <laughs> but so, Section 1340, 18 U.S.C. 1341, here's the U.S. Attorney Manual telling you what the elements of mail fraud are. There are two elements, having devised or intending to devise a scheme to defraud or to perform specified fraudulent acts. That sounds to me like the Clinton Foundation. And use of the mail, Clinton Foundation, for the purpose of executing or attempting to execute the scheme or specified fraudulent acts. I think you have a clear-cut mail fraud case here, hmm. and I think it's massive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just amazing to me. We have the postal system, as Trump rightly says, hemorrhaging money, losing right. money. And here we have being a former... Being gamed by crooks. Being gamed by a former president of the United States and an aspiring president of the United States and all the people who are covering over for him. And, you know, this is... Maybe if we enforce the laws that are on the books, stamp prices would be lower, maybe. <laughs> You know? But this person, this was actually someone with the last name Schmuck engaged yeah, in the lawsuit. Yeah, it's an important American legal precedent. Schmuck versus the United <laughs> States. <laughs> I guess. Uh, you gotta, right. you, you gotta laugh, man. You do. You just you have do. to laugh. So, if we this final link here, if we hit this is a link from the uh, postal people, U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Mm -hmm. about charity fraud. They, they say they take it seriously. Mm. And here they reference down at the very bottom this US, 18 U.S.C. 1341, what I just talked about. Oh, schmucks, read this. Yeah, the penalty is a fine or up to five years imprisonment or both, mm. unless a financial institution is affected. Remember, Bank of, New York, Bank of America, large loan beginning in 2000, in, in 2004. So this alone is 30 years in prison. For each count. For this, well, is, is, in which case the fine may be raised to one million, and imprisonment may be ordered for up to thirty years. So, it, when you have mail fraud, what you would argue is the how many pieces of mail were sent out seeking money? Oh, every single one of them is, is a count. So Hillary is like what, seventy-one, seventy-two? She's a yeah, she's a. I like the idea of her being in jail for thirty years, and they leave her there. She'd be like a skeleton in jail. <laughs> It's not just Hillary. I mean, it's, it would be the trustees. But if they just put her in jail, her up, that would be a good start. I think, you know, the way this gets done and should be done is you have, you have of the first three directors, and mind you, under New Hampshire law, you have to have five directors. So this wasn't a valid uh, charity soliciting New Hampshire when it started in 1998. But um, you have two of the three original directors being the first two deans 
of the Clinton School of Public Service. I mean, Dean Fougere? Oh, no. No, Sorry. Dean Rutherford and Dean, yeah. yeah. I'm just implanting little messages to my friends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we're at the end of the road here on this one. Uh, again, hats off to the, to the art department. I hope, I don't know if there have been any comments, any educated guesses of what P and O could stand for in box. <laughs> Aside from the, those that you've offered offline. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the art department strives to come up with something clever and inspirational each week, Charles. I uh, obviously enjoy making these these are political cartoons, photo composites, so it's a, it's a humorous collection that we've put together. And, you know, actually, I meant to tell people that the Red Bubble Merchandise Store uh, is also coming under attack by the malicious uh, individuals who are trying to shut down Crowdsource the Truth. So people should go there. You can go to redbubble.com and just uh, type in Crowdsource the truth and it will bring up a collection of wonderful items that people can purchase. We've got uh, mugs and t-shirts and any of this artwork that you see can be placed on any of the items. So just because something is shown on a mug doesn't mean that you can't get it on a t-shirt as well. I've just added this really handsome hack to the future <laughs> mug. Quinn and I of course talking about uh, some of the bizarre technology that uh, some of these uh, characters we investigate are having patents on or trying to uh, create. And of course, sometimes Quinn states things in a kind of uh, symbolic or fantastic kind of a way to get people's attention. And sometimes Quinn is trying to uh, evoke a response from artificial intelligence entities around and things like that. So you really need to watch those videos to understand what Quinn is talking about. And of course, it's important that people remember if they're seeing this video right now, either on periscope.tv slash CS, the truth, or if they're seeing it on gab.ai, or if they're seeing it on Facebook at the Crowdsource the Truth Facebook group, or if they're in Russia, Privyet, Kogdila, on the VK social media network on VK.com. They can see our streaming videos there. They can see them on YouTube at Crowdsource the Truth 2. And we're going to keep fighting these malicious, frivolous strikes. We're going to keep fighting fake lawsuits from real idiots. We're going to fight all this nonsense because criminals need to face justice. And no matter what they want to do to me, I'm not going to stop. No, nor am I. Very good. Is there um, anything that you need to update the crowd on about supporting? Well, people can go to patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth and become monthly sponsors. Of course, we never monetize through advertising on YouTube or Google for precisely this reason, because I think that if uh, crowdsource the truth had become financially dependent on YouTube, a system that Google has allowed to become so vulnerable to have so many of these exploitable weaknesses that hackers can, and they are hackers, even if they aren't violating the security protocols of a computer network, they are finding the weakest spot to exploit to game the system. And what YouTube really needs to do is to shore up those weak points. You need to protect the First Amendment constitutional rights of Charles Ortel and myself and the other guests who come on this program, they need to protect my constitutional rights to face my accusers. No anonymous person should be able to submit a strike. And I would even say anonymous people should not be allowed to create content on YouTube at all. If you want to enjoy YouTube and preserve your privacy and anonymity, you should be able to do that by not signing into the system at all and just watching videos anonymously. But if you want to generate content in the form of video content or even comments or likes or dislikes, you should be a known person who if you're going to game the system by having a thousand thumbs down to try to prevent evidence from experts like Charles Ortel, experts like Fabien Chalandon, to try to prevent people from learning the truth, we should know who you are. Cowards should not be able to hide behind anonymous fake internet profiles. They should stand up 
And if they've got a problem with what they're saying, they should say it right to us. Well, indeed, what we say in the beginning, we didn't say it this time, is we do appreciate constructive criticism. Human beings make mistakes. I mean, yeah. look at these two. I mean, uh, but, you know, people make mistakes. We'll make mistakes from time to time. If we have made mistakes, please point them out. If you've got suggestions, please, you know, send them our way. But don't lurk in the shadows as a bunch of cowards. And don't assume that, uh, you know, this is a project that we started last week. I mean, this is, for me, three, three plus years now of doing this, and we're going to push this. We have teams of people around the world who've locked in. We've got deadlines coming for the personal taxes April 15th, 2018 in the U.S., and then foundation filings, uh, disclosures of these material adverse chains should have been made years ago. Every day that you don't make them is a compounding your jeopardy, but you certainly have to do a filing May 15th, 2018. Mm. So... Uh, very Thanks good. again, Jason, for giving me a platform here to go on and on and on, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. As do I, Charles. It's a pleasure working with you, and I learned so much from it. You've shown me that we actually have an international network at our disposal in that the crowdsource community has become worldwide. So these, these cowards hide behind fake profiles and uh, anonymous uh, insults as far away as New Zealand, but uh, we've got people who are in touch with law enforcement as far away as that. So, you know, if, if people want to criticize, absolutely, please do that. I don't even mind being made fun of. There's ways that people can do that. They've taken my videos and edited them up to make funny, clever rap songs that make me look foolish. They can do that. It's when they use them to support false accusations of crime that it crosses the line. And when they steal our intellectual property and do things that are inappropriate, they can't do that. So we'll continue to explore these things. We're going to continue to reveal the financial crimes of the Clintons and their associates. Tomorrow we will have an explosive episode of Harmon Wilfred, America's first refugee. That'll be at 7 p.m. tomorrow, streaming live on periscope.tv slash CS the truth, on YouTube at the Crowdsource the Truth 2 YouTube channel, on Facebook, on VK.com, and all the other platforms that we're on. Of course, our generous sponsors on Patreon can enjoy the live streaming there. I want to thank Charles for joining me. I'm going to wish everybody a pleasant Sunday, and we'll see you tomorrow.